Today's guest is executive coach and president and CEO of MD Consulting, Monique Denault. Monique has more than three decades of experience developing corporate executives into successful leaders ready to change company cultures. She has achieved seven business certifications, including a master of science degree in industrial and organizational psychology, and is an accredited master coach. Monique, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thank you very much, Chris. It's great to be here. No, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. So there's so much to talk about with your career and the fascinating work that you do. Let's start with your personal life. On Next Steps Forward, I often talk about empowerment. You personify what it means to be empowered and truly live a life that thrives off of empowerment. How do you define the word empowerment? To me, empowerment means developing that inner strength that it takes to grow. And that's the short answer because the way that I actually do that and the way that I embody that is by acknowledging the areas that hold me back, doing some very tough work, having difficult conversations, setting boundaries and falling down many times. So I, I really see it as being able to seize the tough situations and create opportunities for personal expansion. You touched on something there that our guest last week on was focused on, and that's boundaries. Could you share some examples of boundaries you set for yourself, for your clients, personally, professionally? As part of my own journey, I had to learn how to set boundaries with the people in my life. And some of those people were toxic. So part of my empowerment meant for me to determine who was toxic, who to let go of in my life and who to keep in my life. Now with clients in coaching, many times they aren't sure how to set boundaries either. So we have to work on that. And that could be boundaries with their manager, boundaries with coworkers or boundaries related to work-life balance because they may be working 70 hours a week and that's too much. Yeah, we've seen that in the new whatever this new norm is through COVID in terms of the never ending work day, uh, you kind of get up, you put your bunny slippers and your sweatpants on and go down to your basement and, and off you go. And there are the emails, you know, and just looking with, uh, with boundaries for one more minute, you know, you, you've talked about letting people go. The guest last week also talked about that in terms of firing friends, you know, how difficult is that to fire friends, to fire clients, you know, what's it take to, to get you to that point? Well, the stronger I've gotten, the easier that gets. But in the beginning, it was really difficult and it took me a long time. I stayed in relationships for way too long. I stayed in friendships for way too long, thinking I was the one that needed to change or I was the one that needed to accommodate that person. And it happened in the workplace too. I stayed in jobs for too long, hoping the boss would stop being so toxic. So now that doesn't happen as often. I've learned how to realize quicker that I need to move on or fire these friends or these people in my life. So it gets easier. It's about practice and it's, it's like flexing a muscle. The more you do it, the easier it gets and that muscle grows. So that's all part of empowerment. You just made the statement you thought it was you that was the one that needed to be changed. What made you realize it's not you, that it's actually your life, your lifestyle, the people around you that were toxic? Was there something that was just a trigger point for you or is it something you realized over time? That really came as part of my growth journey and working with therapists, working with practitioners, learning, growing in that way, realizing that really what toxicity is and how to, how to define it, how to recognize it. So once I understood that, I did an assessment of the people in my life and realized who got to stay and who got to go. <laughs> so I've taken you a bit off topic here. So let's get back to your journey. You dropped out of high school, got married at 16, had two children and was a single mother earned your GED and not one, not two, but yes, count them three degrees and have gone on to become a successful entrepreneur and author. What has empowered you throughout your life's journey? 
my teen marriage was the idea of my father and stepmother in the dysfunctional family that I was in. At that time, I didn't consciously realize it, but I agreed to it because it was a survival technique for me. It was a way out of my father's house. But that decision took me from a situation of abuse and neglect to an abusive marriage. I had my daughters when I was 21 and 22. By that time, I think I intuitively knew that my life was going nowhere. And as immature as I was at that age, I still took my responsibilities really seriously. And I had two children to care for. So in those early days, my children empowered me. They were the ones that empowered me. I had to figure out how to get them into a safer situation. Since then, I've been empowered by my own growth and seeing how I can impact others. And I really feel that I owe it to other human beings to keep moving forward. There's a universal concept that I learned about as I was healing that as you heal yourself, you also help to heal the collective. So the more healing I can do for myself, the more of a ripple effect it'll have on others. And to me, that is empowering. We've had a guest on the show a few times, Andy Berger, who uh, just published a book called Voices Against Trafficking. That's the name of a nonprofit she started. And she was part of sex trafficking from the age of six months old until I believe it was 16 when she got out of the house. What advice do you have for people in, in not only a situation, but you mentioned the word of abusive house and abusive father. What advice do you have for people going through that who are afraid to look for help or afraid to say, hey, we're having a problem? I'm, you know, because I, 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 I know it's not easy. You know, you don't think it's your neighbor. You don't think it's your mailman or your, your bartender or whatever, but it's in your community. It's in your neighborhood. What would you say to somebody like that? It is really difficult to speak up to help yourself. And when I was in my early home, I really attribute everything to my intuition. I didn't consciously think, okay, I have to figure out a way to get out of here. I have to have a plan, but I followed my intuition. And for me, that intuition was, I'm going to get out of this house by getting married. And it's different for everyone, but it is important to have a voice as much as you possibly can to have some kind of a support system, even if it's just a friend. There are people and resources that are available to help. And many times victims are so demeaned and so abused that they aren't even sure what their next step is. So you really have to follow your intuition and do what you can that also keeps you safe because some victims try to speak out and then they put themselves in an unsafe situation. So everyone has to make that decision for themselves. Your journey of healing began through exercise and bodybuilding. Why did you choose that outlet? You know, we'll call it therapy, if you will. That's a great word for it. Therapy, because of my childhood trauma, multiple traumas, I have a condition called complex PTSD. And that is a condition that usually is derived from childhood, multiple traumatic events. After I left my first marriage, I was automatically drawn to moving my body, specifically weight training. And I started that at home in my basement. And later I learned through my journey and educating myself that exercise helps with symptoms of PTSD. So I continued to do that. I felt really empowered. It felt great to be strong, physically strong. It helped me mentally and emotionally. It helped me sleep. And then later I took that one step further and I began competing in women's bodybuilding. And that gave me a focus, again, felt empowering. It improved my confidence level. It increased my self-esteem. And I'm, a, I'm an introvert by nature. So doing something like that was really difficult, but I, I excelled at it and it just really gave me a sense of complete empowerment. I'm just trying to envision, I'm seeing this, you know, powerful, successful entrepreneur, author, 
uh, mother and just thinking of, of the whole bodybuilding thing is just a different different lens to look at you through, which is which is fantastic. Thank you. So, you know, you've said that you spent a lot of your life in the healing process and you're not done yet. Do you think that people tend to believe they get over trauma more quickly than they actually do? And if so, what do you believe contributes to that mindset? Well, I know that I had that mindset. I wanted to get through the trauma and wanted to be what I considered done, done with my healing. And I've talked to a lot of others who have the same mindset. I, I think we, as humans, we want to get over it quickly. It, healing from trauma is like walking through hell and who wants to be there? But it is ongoing. It took me a while to learn that. And I was a little bummed out when I learned that, that you never really arrive. You're never really done. It's a process. But it is ongoing. And I think that's actually a good thing. You can, you can change your perception of that walk through hell. Not every day is hellish for me. And for me, I've separated my healing process into two parts. There's my ongoing growth, which is what I consider maintenance. And that I take charge of, making sure I grow in various ways and learn. And then there's the other part, which is my PTSD symptoms. And those times when my symptoms flare up and they're triggered, that part is still hellish but I've learned to take charge of that too. I have a proactive plan. I have specific things I can do when my symptoms flare up. I have a team of traditional and non-traditional practitioners that help me. I made the decision a long time ago to not use medication for my symptoms. And that decision was a tough decision and it's not for everybody. But because I've made that decision, I have this team that I activate whenever my symptoms flare up and it probably takes longer and it's probably harder than to do things without medication. But I have really learned a lot from that. And it's been, again, something that has contributed to my sense of empowerment. I appreciate you referencing the, the PTSD and we've had a lot of shows on our live guests on the show, professional patient talking about PTSD and different ways that they go through it, the ways that they treat it, you know, how to treat it. And it's not an easy thing. You know, I I've said a couple of times I've learned over the last couple of years, I've self-diagnosed myself as having post-traumatic stress from the events of nine 11. You know, I used to work at the world trade center and was there that day. And, you know, a big focus on the show has been on mental health. And certainly as we've stumbled through the, the COVID pandemic here, and the one thing, one positive thing I've said throughout COVID is that it's put a positive spotlight on mental health. You know, PTSD is maybe a, a sister of that, but the spotlight's been in, in a positive way. And so, you know, trying to alleviate and reduce or even eliminate hopefully the stigma. And so having more people like yourself, having champions come out there and just use that in everyday kitchen table conversation uh, is welcome. And so I appreciate you being so, so candid with us. So thank you. You're welcome. Faith plays a role in your well-being. You're a former Catholic who is now a practicing Buddhist. How has faith helped you in your journey of healing? Well, to me, faith involves intuition. And as I mentioned, my intuition has always been very strong. It's always steered me toward various forms of spirituality and self-reflection. It's the self-reflection part that has played a really impactful role in my healing. And to me, that is spiritual. It's helped me make sense out of my trauma. It's helped me process the events that have happened to me. And it's given meaning to those events. So journaling, meditating, writing my book, contemplation, breath work, all of those are spiritual practices to me and things that I do every day now as part of my journey and my, my proactive healing. Let's shift gears for a minute and talk about your work as an executive coach. What drew you into that profession? In my corporate career, I was naturally drawn to helping people develop in the corporate world through corporate training. So I did a lot of internal training as a corporate employee. 
I then realized that people in my corporate classes needed and wanted more individual attention. That brought me to my current career as an entrepreneurial coach in private practice. Through coaching, people can take part in a more customized goal setting that's related specifically to their own growth. Whereas in a, in a class, I'm speaking to the audience and it's a generalized curriculum. So by working with people individually, I'm able to help them set goals, develop a plan, figure out the next steps and execute that plan and even measure it, which is a lot more fulfilling for me than when I was working with groups of people. You make the point that coaching is not therapy. What are the important distinctions between the two? Therapy focuses a lot on previous trauma, the dynamics of past family and personal issues and how to heal from that. Ex the executive coaching that I do focuses not on the past and not so much on personal issues, more on current work-related issues and goals. And in coaching, there's no giving of advice. There's no mentoring. It's not like consulting. So the methodology is very different. It's more of a collaborative process. And what should someone who works with an executive coach expect in terms of process, results? You, know, you mentioned measurements of success. Well, in coaching, we set goals. And that's the foundation of what we do in coaching. I work with them to determine their goals. We collaboratively prioritize them. We determine together what the measurements are. So as a coach, I'm not the one that says, hey, this is how we're going to know if you're succeeding or not. I let them tell me how they know that they will be succeeding in this goal. Or I work with them to fine tune that measurement a little bit. So it's all about how the client will feel successful. And that could be even something like getting more sleep. That could be a measurement of work-life balance. Or sometimes I have them rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 where they think they're at now with that goal. And then in six weeks, they rate themselves again. So sometimes it's a measurement that's that simple. It's on a, a rating scale or even five hours more a week of free time is one measurement that they can, that they can use or maybe getting a direct report promoted if they are a, a leader. So we spend a lot of time zooming in and out. And what I mean by that is that the, the goal is the end result. So that's the big picture. That's the zoom out of it. The zoom in is always the small steps we take to get them there. And some people focus too much on the zooming out or vice versa, and they don't zoom in and out. So as a coach, I keep them accountable and help them zoom in and out so we can look at the big picture of the goal, come back to those daily steps they need to take, and then periodically look back out at the goal and gauge their progress. Have you found it more challenging through COVID with the extended workday in terms of helping these executives? You mentioned the work-life balance a moment ago, figuring that out, you know, five hours more free time sounded easier two years ago than it does today because you could compartmentalize life and work and extracurricular activities. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, I'm the guilty culprit of coming down on my bunny slippers and sweats in the morning and logging in at six o'clock with a cup of coffee. And I'm still on 11 o'clock at night. You know, how do we change, evolve? Hopefully we get back to some sense of normalcy in the new year. Does that just put an extra challenge for you and your clients? It was very challenging when COVID first happened and everyone moved to a remote work environment. Those very same problems happened. They logged on really early. They worked really late. There was no separation between work and home. And a lot of it was really related to inaccurate expectations. So some people figured, well, I'm not commuting, so I need to spend that hour or so online on the, you know, logged into work. Other times people just thought their managers expected the extra work. 
So with my clients, I started working first and foremost on what is the expectation? What is realistic? What is your expectation of yourself? What is the accurate expectation of your manager? And once those conversations started happening and people actually had conversations with their managers about that, it eliminated at least some of the issue. Because when people realize, okay, my boss is not expecting me to work through my commute time, then they were fine about starting a little bit later. The next challenge was really getting people to get off of their computers at a reasonable time. And sometimes that would be as simple as one of their action items would be to shut the computer, literally physically close it when they got done working or leave the room and close the door. Putting up some kind of a physical boundary sometimes helped their mental mindset to get away from that. And other times it was things like uh, managers actually needed to say that there would be no more meetings on Fridays or half days would be no meetings so that people were not going right from one meeting to the other on the computer. They had some time to, to eat, to get up and take a walk. So it was little things like that. I think now it's gotten better, but in the first eight months or so, it was pretty chaotic. <laughs> Yeah, our, I've been fortunate. Our, our firm, um, they've in, uh, instituted meeting-free Fridays. So not, no internal, if there's a client meeting, great, you have that. And then our CEO's name is Doug, and he calls them Doug Days. And he'll actually give either a Friday or a Monday. It's usually around a long weekend. The entire firm was not uh, essential business. You have that day off. Now, our clients don't have the day off, but you know it's, it's a nice, uh, yes. nice way to kind of at least lighten the, the workload a little bit. Yes, I, I agree. And, and that is the kind of thing that was very necessary. Yep, absolutely agree. You obviously have to build trust with someone to be able to get to the crux of their challenges and unlock their true potential. How do you know what that question is to ask a client to get to the bottom of what could be holding them back? And especially when that could be something that's very personal. This is how I leverage my trauma. And I always encourage people to leverage their experiences. So my trauma has given me a lot of superpowers. And to your point, I, I have to build trust really fast with my clients, yet it's got to be authentic. I need them to be transparent with me. I need them to be honest and open as much as they're willing to be. And our sessions are not hours and hours long. Our sessions are 30 to 45 minutes. So I need to build trust fast. And like I mentioned before, I'm an introvert. I'm also an HSP, which stands for highly sensitive person. And between those two things, I have been able to really use my skill set. I have really good listening skills. I have a really powerful insight. Again, because of my trauma, it has caused me to be extra sensitive to other people and what's going on with them or around them. So I can build trust really quickly. I have a high level of empathy and I, I know to ask deeper questions to help them think and to help them reflect. So my heightened sense of awareness toward them allows me to ask those questions. So for example, if someone comes to coaching and they're telling me about their boss who is controlling, that they have a very controlling boss, I might ask the question, well, what comes up for you when that happens? And they then might suddenly say, well, it reminds me of my controlling father from when I was a child and I felt helpless. And then I can ask the question, what can you do to handle that differently this time? So unlike therapy, we don't go talking about the controlling father from the past. We stay in the present and I pose that question, what can you do differently this time? That then becomes our coaching topic where we start to strategize ways that a person could handle a boss like that, which empowers them because now they have choices. So all of that can actually happen within about 20 minutes. And then the strategizing can take another 20 minutes. And by the time the session is over, we haven't resolved the controlling boss because that's not my client's problem, but we have identified 
ways that my client can handle the person differently or ways that they can respond instead of react. And that's all because of some of these deeper questions that I knew intuitively to ask them. Do a lot of CEOs have past trauma that blocks their success? I don't have any general statistics on that from formal research, but I can tell you that about 80% of my clients do have past trauma. And those are the ones who've disclosed it. There may be some that haven't disclosed it yet. I, and I work with people from the director level up to the C-suite. So I, I am seeing a lot of it, unfortunately. And I know you said there's no formal stats, but do you have any insights about the rest of the workforce as far as how trauma affects their performance? From what I know from my clients and from myself when I was in the corporate world, unresolved trauma has the following impact. Low motivation, lack of psychological safety, reduced creativity, poor communication skills, missed deadlines, higher amounts of conflict, higher absenteeism and attrition. So it, it really impacts the entire segment of the workforce. And there's trauma, which most people recognize, and there's something called microtrauma that you're very tuned to. What is microtrauma and how common is it? Microtrauma is obvious or covert, consistent behavior that demeans other people by slowly chipping away at their self-esteem. It could be something as obvious as bullying. It could be a manager that withholds feedback. Even if the feedback is positive or negative, a person deserves to know how they're doing in their role. So subtle threats, sarcasm, passive aggressive behavior, gaslighting, verbal put downs, uh, contradictions, withholding raises from people, promises of promotion, but then constantly raising the bar, just really forcing people to jump through hoops, unclear expectations. It, micro trauma is really rampant in the workplace and it covers all of these things and many more things. We're talking before the break about trauma, micro trauma, and how it affects people in the workplace. Monique, we've all heard or seen stories about the executives with legendary tempers, the bully bosses who terrorize their employees. What does it say about an executive who rules by terror? Well, unfortunately, that's very prevalent in the workplace. And it's, it is really difficult for people to speak up to somebody like that. It's difficult for them to sometimes even recognize that it's wrong. If the culture itself is that way, employees feel like, well, this is just how it is. So I always say, if you are leading that way, you're not really leading. Leading isn't terrorizing. Influencing is leading. So it's important that people stand up to bosses like that and that they have a voice. As much as I don't like to say this phrase because it's contradictory to the show's title, let's step back a bit for a minute and look at the bigger picture. In your experience, how are executives different than other people, if at all? They're different in that they have more responsibilities and they have more stress on them because of those responsibilities. But otherwise, they have the same fears, they have the same anxieties, but their level of responsibility exacerbates all of that and creates more stress. They, they truly want to lead and be good at what they're doing, but they, there's the mindset that leaders have to know everything. They have to have all the answers and that's simply not the case. So what you're saying is they put their pants on one leg at a time like the rest of us and they are human, even though we don't think sometimes they, they might not be? Absolutely, yes. And in terms of a leadership question, you, know, you mentioned how they feel like they might have to have all the answers. What can we do to help empower our bosses, our leaders to make them feel like they do or maybe guide them in the right direction? Is it something as simple as 
you've got an idea, but you want to help them make it their idea so they can, you know, sort of direct it from there or what are some tips along those lines? Really it's connecting. <clears throat> it's about connecting with your manager, having conversations to understand what you can do to help your manager. And with those kinds of conversations, then we get into a lot of the soft skills, communication skills, empathy on both sides. So I think as, as people who are direct reports, it's important for them to have conversations with their managers, whether it's in team meetings or one-to-ones, and really discuss what, what the expectation is of the direct report, how can the direct report help more. I coach a lot of leaders about delegating, delegating to their direct reports to, for a couple of reasons, to eliminate things from their own plate, but to empower their direct reports. And those kinds of things can help immensely for a leader if they are delegating, if they're doing it correctly. And I work with them in coaching on how to do it correctly. And then as a direct report, it's important to look at those opportunities and take them on if you can. I coach around how delegation isn't something that you push on somebody because many leaders feel guilty about delegating. Again, they think they have to know everything, do everything. So I coach them around the fact that it's a conversation that they have with their direct reports, letting them know that this opportunity has come up, they'd like to delegate it, and it's the direct report who can choose to take it on or not. But then I coach the direct reports to try to take on as much as they reasonably can to stretch themselves and to help themselves grow. And as a follow-up to that, a moment ago, I sort of joked about, you know, leaders and bosses putting pants on one leg at a time. Do we need to think of the boss as less of an authority figure and more of a person just like, like us, or do they need that distance between them and the people they lead to be effective in their roles? I think it's a balance of both. A leader needs to be an authority. And at times they need to make these executive decisions where it's not collaborative. But at the same time, they are still human and they need to connect with their people. And I think that's a big part of what's missing in today's workplace. It's that the absence of connection, which is exacerbated by COVID and the fact that everybody's remote, but connection can still happen. So it's the, the answer is both. There has to be a balance of that leader being the authority figure, but still connecting with their people. And I coach a lot of people who have been recently promoted and they are now managing former peers. And they're extremely uncomfortable about that because their former peers were their friends. Now they are supervising their former peers. So it is a delicate balance but it, it happens with connection, expectations, and back to setting boundaries. They have to set boundaries at their new level, but that, that can be done. It, it happens all the time and it's very successful. I think my New Year's resolution is gonna be focused on boundaries because that seems to be a more and more prevalent topic on the shows we've been having recently. So I, I appreciate you helping me figure that one out. I think this gets back to the question about how executives are different than others. It seems like all of us have enough headaches and challenges in our current jobs. What drives someone who wants to take on the burden of leading dozens or hundreds or thousands of people day in, day out, and all the problems that go along with that? I can speak from the people that I coach. And the people that I coach desperately want to be good leaders. They want to make a difference. They have a personal mission or a mission that's related to the company's mission, and they want to lead. Now, in doing that, they are faced with numerous challenges, including toxic workplaces and other kinds of dysfunction. But they have this drive that's based on their mission, their values, wanting to make a difference, and wanting to influence their team to do the same thing. So, I think that from what I'm seeing is what is driving these people to continue doing what they're doing, moving up the ladder, trying to have more influence as they go. You mentioned the word drive. 
is drive something that is, you know, you, you said also looking to make a change. Is it people sort of looking to really make things better? Is it ego driven? Is it financial rewards? Some or all of the above? All of the above. And we unpack that when they come to coaching because the drive has to be authentic. It ha there has to be something that is, and, and even if it's money, that's authentic. There's no shame in wanting to be paid for what we do, but it's important to be conscious of your reasons. And in coaching, that's one of the things we unpack is what are your, what are your reasons? Why, why is this important to you? Why is this a goal? And sometimes unpacking something like that causes a person to shift the goal. They decide that's not really what they want, or they don't want it for the reasons that they thought they wanted it. So coaching is very, very much a process of self-discovery. And our conversations involve a lot of self-discovery and reflection. We know there are different types of leadership styles. How can we identify a boss's leadership style and then adapt to it so that we can be more effective or have a better relationship with them? This is a question my clients ask all the time. And while there are many formal and informal tools and assessments to help a person determine someone's leadership style, the absolute best way is to ask, have a conversation. So it's back to that communication and connecting again, human to human. It's better than any assessment that's out there. It's better than making an assumption. And it really helps to foster trust and transparency. So a lot of times in coaching, I'll help my clients come up with some key questions to ask if they are getting a new leader or if they're new, newly promoted and they're worried about, I wonder what kind of leader he is or she, I wonder how to work with that person. So I help them craft some key questions that they can ask in their one-to-one -one with their manager. Things like, how would you describe yourself as a leader? Or how would others describe you as a leader? What type of leadership style resonates the most with you? What can I do to help you lead better? All of those kinds of open-ended questions will help to get the conversation flowing much better than trying to have someone do an assessment or looking at an assessment, trying to figure a person out. You've noted that a common misconception that you see among leaders is that they have to be visible in order to maintain authority. Obviously, since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, visibility has become even more difficult due to working from home and a change in work schedules. Why don't you believe that a leader needs to be visible to be effective? You know, and what advice would you impart on a leader who is having trouble coping with visibility when it comes to their authority? Yes, I don't think a leader needs to be visible to be effective. Because again, it's more about connecting than anything. And there are many ways to connect with others. And leaders can connect by creating more structure in their one-to-ones and in their team meetings. Sometimes leaders turn these meetings into status updates. That's all. It's all about business, status updates, the numbers. But these meetings should be more than that. They are should be an opportunity for leaders to use empathy, to use listening skills, to ask their own open-ended questions, and to show a genuine concern for their people. Without that, even in-person visibility will fail. Obviously, the pandemic caught us all off guard, and it especially affected those leaders who think they have to be right there with us in person to maintain their authority. How else does it affect the corporate executives that you coach? In so many ways, there were initially problems with managing remote teams. How do you manage people who aren't all in the same building, staying connected, needing more empathy for the employees and their families, their family situations, because there were so many things happening within the family setting that it impacted things that way. Managers had to reduce their expectations. They had to relax them just based on everything that was going on. And that was hard for very driven leaders to do, to relax the expectations. As we've already talked about, work-life balance was an issue. 
also leaders had to address their desire to micromanage. Many leaders have that type of behavior where they need to micromanage, but they couldn't do it with people not in the same building. So that actually was a very positive thing that came up for them. And we had, we dealt with it in coaching a lot. Managers were coming to coaching very anxious, even fearful because they didn't know how to tell if the work was getting done because they couldn't manage it. So we had to address their own issues with control and micromanaging. And then they, at certain points, would relax and, and just let it flow a little bit and realize that the work was getting done. You can always tell if work isn't getting done because someone will miss a deadline or a client will call and complain or a customer will be upset. So minus those kinds of things, you can pretty much assure yourself that the work is getting done and there would be no need to micromanage. But those were, that's an idea of some of the other things that came up. So as the business world slowly reopens, uh, especially those in sales, some of these business leaders are looking to lead by example and you know, getting back on the road. Not everyone's fully comfortable going into the office, going to see clients, traveling, what advice would you have for those folks who may be afraid to talk to their boss or to their leader about, hey, you know, I'm not comfortable because of X, Y, or Z? I always encourage the conversation. People do need to voice their, their comfort level. They need to think about their safety. So that's going to be different for everyone. And it has to be a conversation. Managers, HR people, HR departments, they can't read people's minds. So if you don't express yourself, then your needs will not be met. And I work a lot with people helping them to craft statements, either verbal or emails, to help express their needs about things like this. And that kind of goes back to expectations because an employee will have an expectation for a company or for their manager. But if it's not put out there and voiced, it will never get met. You said one thing that you've seen is executives often try to change who they are to fit their company's brand. You encourage people to do the exact opposite, to take their life's experiences and protect their own personal brand. How does that work? I really encourage people not to try to fit in. I encourage them to stand out. So when I'm working with someone related to branding, I have to help them understand that the more different they are, the more special they are, the more they will catch the eye of someone, whether it, they're looking for an internal promotion or an external promotion, or they're just trying to have more influence within the company. They have to stand out and they have to, the, the process I use with them is to first get in touch with their values. We do a lot of work around values assessments, work values, personal values. I like to make sure that they are in alignment with their values. So we do some work around that. I use a strength assessment because it's very important that people realize what their strengths are. People do not give themselves enough credit. They don't want to feel like they're bragging. They don't like to self-promote. So they don't pay attention to their strengths. With the strengths assessment, we look at exactly what they're good at. And then I work with them to develop a mission statement and it's very unique to them. So then with their values, with their strengths, with their mission statement, then I look at accomplishment statements with them. And we spend a lot of time crafting specific statements that point out and validate what they've accomplished. And we attach those to metrics so that they can measure what they've accomplished. Then after all of that, we update their resume, we update their LinkedIn profile, and I coach them on how to weave all of that information into conversations so that they can have conversations where they're actually self-promoting their brand. And it's different than bragging. I have to have them understand the difference between the two. There's definitely a distinction there. We have about five minutes left. I want to make sure we talk about your writing. 
When you were contributing author to the bestseller, Ophelia's Mom, and the self-published collaboration, How to Win and Keep Clients. And now you have a new book in the works. Tell us about that, please. The new book is called Leading in Captivity, A Survival Guide for Corporate Executives. It is something that my, my other two works were self-published or part, I was a part of a collaboration. This one I've written myself and I've chosen not to self-publish. So I'm currently pitching it to publishers. I've just finished the manuscript. It's in the editing phase and I'm searching for publishers. So the title is a working title, but it's really a self-help book specifically for corporate leaders. It provides a process to help them heal from previous personal trauma, navigate current workplace trauma, and support their teams so that they have a solid unit, a solid healthy unit within the workplace. So it weaves in parts of my personal story into each chapter. And it also gives them step-by-step -step processes as how they can, as to how they can improve themselves and then how they can take those skills and transfer it to have more influence in the organization and with their teams. I get the survival guide for corporate executive subtitle. I know you said it's a working title, but how did you choose leading in captivity? My clients described to me that they are leading with their hands tied. They're given high level positions. They're being put into all these situations, but they're being undermined. They're being subjected to environments of toxicity. There's multiple roadblocks. They're trying to lead, but they're held captive within their own workplace. So that is how I came up with the title, Leading in Captivity. And will there be lessons in there for folks who aren't currently executives or maybe aspire to be executives? Yes, there will be plenty of tips and tools for people who want to be happier and make a difference in the workplace, whether they're wanting to move up the ladder or not. Well, please keep us updated in terms of where you're going in the publishing process. Uh, as someone who has a manuscript that's currently collecting a lot of dust, I understand what you're going through and appreciate the, the effort that you're doing. So uh, hats off and kudos to you. We're just about out of time today. Any parting words of advice to our audience to help us feel more empowered, get to the day and really be successful in our lives? I have three main points that I hope will be the main takeaways of our time together today. Learn to self-promote because it's very, very important. And it also helps you to have a voice embrace your growth, and then use your natural gifts to be more influential in the workplace. Now, if somebody wants to reach out to you in terms of getting coaching advice, find your books, how can they find you? My website is www.mdconsultingglobal.com. And my email address is monique at mdconsultingglobal.com. And you're very active on LinkedIn, which is how we got connected. So that's always the yes. safe route for me anyway. Yes. And I have a YouTube channel with a lot of really short videos, many of them, including some of our topics from today. Terrific. We'll be sure to share that in our social media as well. Monique Denault, Executive Coach, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. And as always, thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek public figure and on Twitter at Chris Meek underscore USA. We'll be back next Tuesday, same time, same place with another leader from the world of business, politics, public policy, sports, or entertainment. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.